So today's story takes us to the Obafemi Awolowo University in Ileife. In the entire history of Nigerian campus court attacks, this is unarguably the most gruesome and merciless of them all. An entire squad of courtes descended on the once peaceful campus in the still of the night, causing atrocious acts and mayhem. By the time they were done, several lives were lost. Welcome to my channel. My name is Annie and I just love telling you true crime stories. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, kindly click on that subscribe button and like this video so that YouTube can recommend it to other viewers. The day is Saturday and it's the 7th of March 1999. There was this kind of secretive meeting by a group of individuals, presumably students in the town of Ife. After they had had this meeting, they took the main road that led to the OAU campus. OAU is an abbreviation for Obafemi Owolowo University of Ife, just in case you're confused. So as they drove towards the campus, another group of students in a different vehicle overtakes them and immediately something wrong began to happen. At this point, it's not even clear what caused the bad blood between them. Some reports say that muddy water was splashed on the vehicle of this one who had just concluded a meeting. So they gave chase to the students and the other car who had splashed water on them. Knowing that they were in trouble, the ones who were being chased drove frantically as they raced to the campus and parked their vehicle at the car park outside Angola Hall. As they all got out of the vehicle, they took to their heels, all of them running for safety to their Wolowo and Mozambique halls, which were just adjacent to where they had parked outside Angola Hall. For some reasons, they were extremely and genuinely scared of this other group of fellow students giving them a chase. And the fear was validated as the driver of that vehicle was traced to Mozambique Hall where he thought he was safe and he was dragged out and beaten up pretty badly. The news spread rather quickly around the school and students were wondering what type of students were these that scared their fellow students so much they had to run like their lives depended on it. And even at that, they still caught one of them and assaulted him without fear of the school authorities. The student who had been beaten up, that's the driver of that vehicle, went straight to the student's union executive's block and reported what had been done to him. As the incident called to the student's union, they began to move around to know where this group of students had come from. Because prior to this, they had gotten a tip of that members of a group believed to be courtes were staying at a house in the senior staff quarters of the school. So upon learning that another group of students were chased down and assaulted, they mobilized and drove to the said house. At this time, the student union president, Lanry Adeleke, popularly known as Legacy, was out of town on an official assignment. Before I proceed, I would like to say that whenever you hear me call the name Legacy, I mean the president of the student union government at the time. He was this very charismatic guy that was well loved by the students. So Legacy was out of town, like I said, so he couldn't do much. The head of the group that had gone to find out who these people were that were camping in the boys' quarters of the senior staff quarters on their campus was the SUG Secretary General, a young man who was very loved for his unionism and his fight for the right of students. His name was George Iwilade, popularly known as Africa. Africa was accompanied by Saka Mohammed, who was the Speaker of the House. So just like Legacy, if you ever hear me call Africa, I mean George Iwilade. Upon their arrival at the said apartment, which by the way was supposed to be officially occupied by one Mr. F.M. Mikoma, they knocked and tried to gain entry, but everywhere was quiet and the door was locked. So they assumed no one was actually at the house. But just as they were about to leave, they noticed that there was movement inside the house. So they forced their way in and found nine individuals holed up in the tiny room. Eight of which were actually students of the University of Ife, while one was not. And the things that they found inside this apartment only confirmed that the rumors going around were actually true. In the apartment, under the bed, they found about four submachine guns, another locally made one, an axe, a bayonet and the regalia of a certain court group. Africa and his group rounded up these guys, 
the first of all took them to Awoluwo Hall. Due to fear of mob attack, they didn't want to make them available to other students as there was already tension on campus because of what had happened to the guy who was beaten up earlier. By the time they were done with them in that Awoluwo Hall, these individuals voluntarily gave up the information that they were of a truth on campus for initiation into a cop group. This was something the student union had tried so hard to keep away from the University of Ife at the time. So, according to these guys, a very senior staff member was their patron and he was well aware of their activities. I wonder who this person was, but it's not hard to believe since they were obviously camping at the senior staff quarters. Knowing what they knew at the time, there was no way the SCG would have handed them over to the school authorities. With the information they were able to extract from these guys, it wouldn't have been wise, you know, it wouldn't have been a wise thing to do. So they handed them over to the police at the area command at More in Ife instead. Meanwhile, the university authorities were informed of the development. The student union wanted an explanation from the senior staff member if there was any truth to the accusations that were being laid on him or not. But before you could say Jack, the school management hurriedly closed down the school and sent students packing from the hostels in a very suspicious manner. So while students were on this compulsory break, the court members were charged to court and only two weeks after the incident, they all made bail. You can imagine this, right from jump, the case was not handled properly. While this was not in any way surprising because the system in Nigeria does not actually work. But still, to some extent, it was not expected that a case of such magnitude where weapons were involved would be tried and concluded in only two court appearances and only within the short period of eight days without a single witness being called to the stand to testify. Not even Africa and his group who had apprehended the courtes were subpoenaed to appear in court. So the case was heard from 24 to the 31st and on the 31st of March, the judge discharged and acquitted the arrested individuals. That was enough reason to raise eyebrows, right? Something happened somewhere for the trial to be conducted in such a hurried manner. The judge ordered that the weapons found at the point of arrest be sent to the police armory while every other evidence be destroyed. I have never heard of such a thing like this before. Well, that simply means that the case could no longer be reopened. Following their acquittal, these guys returned to the university campus when the students were called back from the compulsory break in June and they were going about their lives like nothing had happened just barely three months prior. Students were very angry and uncomfortable having them around and the students through the SUG began to mount pressure on the school authorities to do the needful. The school authorities who then, in a bid to appease the student, had a press release that stated that they were going to suspend the students involved in this case, but they didn't do as they said they would. The school authorities did not inform the affected students officially that they had been suspended from the university. In the meantime, other students were not okay seeing these guys whom they presumed to be dangerous around their campus and because of how the situation was and how volatile the campus was, the school had to be shut down again so students could calm down at least before they returned. Three months later, OAU reopened and the students upon their return to school were once again disappointed to discover that the students they were told were suspended were actually around on campus going about with their normal school activities, attending lectures and all. Once again, students refused to have this group of guys amongst them. I mean, they feared for their safety, so they began to pressure the school authorities to do the need for at least. So, the school authorities had no other choice than to issue yet another press release on the 2nd of July 2019. In it, they told students that the affected individuals would be issued suspension letters. The letters were then actually prepared. The suspension was to take effect from July the 8th, but it's not even clear if the affected students were given their letters of suspension even though they were ready for collection because the night of July 9th will become the night no one will forget in the hall. But before I go into details of the horrific events of July the 9th, I'm going to ask you again to kindly subscribe to this channel and give this video a thumbs up then I can proceed to walk you through the events leading up to the course night of July the 9th. 
So there had been programs organized by the SUG in honor of the late MKO Abiola and other activists on the 8th through the 9th. Lots of human rights activists were invited and they gave talks to students bordering different areas. The program was not a one-day event and by the end of it, the organizers were tired. Then after that, there was to be yet another program on the 10th that they all needed to attend in Lagos. So everyone was preparing for that particular event, including Legacy and Africa. On the night of July the 9th, at about 8 p.m., Legacy was at the office assigned to him as the student union president when one of the guys who had been arrested back in March walked up to the office, opened the door and greeted him. He looked at Legacy and says, good evening, Mr. President. Then he walks out immediately. Remember, Legacy wasn't around at the time of that incident. That's when the guys were arrested at the staff quarters. So he didn't recognize this person enough to even link him to that incident. He had assumed that it was just a regular student greeting him, but someone else who was at that office recognized this person and told Legacy who he was. Instantly, Legacy asked everyone to go looking for this person and bring him back into the office, but he was nowhere to be found. The whole scenario was just bizarre and weird. Was this incident a way of making sure that Legacy was still on campus and had been marked? Because it sure did look like they were scoping the environment at the time. Well, let me know what you think after you might have heard the rest of the story. Fast forward to at about 9 p.m. ish, Legacy was done at the office and he retired to his quarters. Meanwhile, that night, that very night, the student group known as the Kegai had a party popularly known as Gyration on campus. It's like an annual team they do to bring all Kegai's from other campuses together. So in attendance were various members of the SUG and Man O' War. They had always wanted to honor Africa at the event, but being so tired from all the programs they had had, Africa asked that they allow him to catch some sleep. Then when it's close to the time he will be honored, they could come get him. He really needed that sleep badly in order to function properly, to which the organizers agreed. So the care guides were gathered at the open area between the Angola and Mozambique halls, singing, drinking, dancing, and making merry, just enjoying their gyration. As the night went on, everything seemed normal at first. It was getting quite late, so some students who had attended the party began to flock to the cafeteria at Awolowo Hall as others went back to their hostels to catch some sleep. Africa by this time was in his room fast asleep. His room was very close to that of Legacy. There was just only one room in between them. Legacy was also asleep in his own room as well. He was passed out on the floor, just laying fast asleep on the rug. Then a female friend of his came to check up on him and she made sure he got up from the rug to sleep on the bed. But something weird occurred while she was still in that room. There was this knock on the door of Legacy's room and from the outside, someone called out to him. They were like, Legacy, Legacy, are you there? And the lady responded, telling the person to please come back later, that Mr. President was tired and needed to rest. To this day, no one knows who this person was that came to knock. But knowing what we know now, this could have been like a final attempt at confirming to know if Legacy was still in his room at that particular time. Soon as Legacy falls back asleep, the lady leaves the room and while she was still on the staircase, she hears the first gunshot at Awolowo Hall. It's not clear how she escaped, but she didn't go back to notify Legacy. She just ran for her dear life. So by that wee hours of the morning, it's now July the 10th, right? At around 3 a.m. to 3.30 a.m. ish, evil was unleashed on the OAU campus as a large number, a very large number of courtists descended on the quiet university campus. Some reports say that they were up to 40. Assuming this number is accurate, that is indeed large, and these guys were said to be all members of a particularly well-known dreaded campus court group. Their intention was to take out as many members of the student union government. Their issue with the student union government was that they spearheaded and pushed for the expulsion of their members who had been arrested in the earlier incident that I narrated. This operation was no joke. These guys came prepared in their numbers. They were well coordinated like a SWAT team. So this is how they moved. They drove in through the school main gate and then to the car park located next to the tennis court in the sports center. 
these main gates they came through usually close at exactly 12 midnight and it wouldn't be open for anyone no matter who you were until 6 a.m but miraculously it was open for these guys to come in at that hour security guards were supposed to be stationed at that gate and usually they had walkie talkies on them which they communicated with each other but interestingly somehow none of them securities were at the gate and the walkie talkies they all had flat batteries all at the same time too convenient huh now upon their arrival after they had parked their vehicles, they took the food path in the bushy area along the Awolowo Hall and arrived at the open area where the Kegites were having their gyration. As they stepped on that ground, it was chaos. They began firing sporadically and wielding their axes and their machetes as students began to run for their lives. There were some students who were at the Wolowo Hall cafeteria and they all tried to flee the hall at the same time, leading to a stampede that left many injured. The final number would be above 20. These guys, who by the way were wearing black clothes with their faces hidden behind masks, shouted and called out for Africa, Legacy and Dexter. Dexter, by the way, was the leader of the K-guys. He was also a target for whatever reasons. They came ready for war and didn't care who else was going to be collateral damage. They went towards blocks 5 and 6 of their Awolowo Hall. Then they divided into groups as some made their way into room 184. There, they saw a guy who was just in his 200 level in psychology department. His name was Efe Ekede. They wasted him immediately and moved on to room 230 where they met another guy. His name was Charles Ita. He was a 200 level law student. In fact, they met Charles while they were going up the stairs. Actually, they slapped him hard across the face and he, not knowing who they were, returned back the favor. So they shot at him and used an axe and a machete on him. At this point, he ran for his dear life and hid. At his hideout, he lost consciousness, but later on he will be found and taken to the hospital where he survived after being in coma for seven full days. As all this was going on, another group of the attackers were at the Kegai's headquarters. As they moved in the corridors leading to the rooms, they met a final year religious studies student called Yemi Ajituru. Mind you, this was the same building housing the student union government. So what they did was to first of all switch off all the lights and everywhere was pitch dark except the light provided by the moon. Meanwhile, that first gunshot downstairs had woken up Legacy and he quickly got up and ran outside. Yemi Ajeturu, the guy from earlier, had been sleeping outside with his girlfriend when the shots ran. She immediately got up and ran when she had the shots to take refuge downstairs in the Kegai's headquarters. And that swift movement drew the attention of the attackers. That was how they even saw Yemi Ajeturu in the first place. Because at first they didn't even know that he was there on the corridor lying there just sleeping. And that was about the same moment that Legacy had come out of his room to see what was going on. He was right behind Yemi, but they didn't see him because it was dark. Three of the attackers opened fire at Yemi and they caught him right in the head. They put a hole in his head, taking his life instantly. Seeing what had just happened, Legacy runs back into his room. That was room 271. He had put two and two together quickly and knew exactly what it was that was going on. So as he ran back into his room, he was trying to figure out how to get across to his secretary general, that's Africa, because he knew for a fact that there would be targets, but there was no way he could do that without drawing attention to himself or being seen. It was a two-story building and they were on the top floor. So he escaped through his own window to the window of the next room, room 272, which was occupied by a medical student. They both climbed out of his window, hanging on for their dear lives on the two-story window without a harness. Together, they tried to alert Africa from their position, but he was fast asleep. So somehow they got to the other room after his and other students were there, scared and just waiting for the worst to happen. As the attackers broke into Legacy's room, they didn't find him there and this infuriated them. They started shouting, Legacy, if you're bold enough, come out, come out, as they broke into room 273. In that room, they came face to face with one of their targets, George Iwilade, also known as Africa, the revered law student and the secretary general of the student union. Africa had been fast asleep because he was extremely tired and exhausted that day like I earlier explained. 
and he wasn't even aware of the commotion going on outside his room. As the attackers barged into his room, he just woke up and was dazed and confused. And before he could even understand what was going on, they put a hole in his head, taking him out instantly. And even though he was gone, they still took out their anger out on him. They used their machetes and axes on him mercilessly. Remember, Africa was the one who led the arrest as it relates to the incident that happened on Saturday, 7th March 1999 at the senior staff quarters. That made them really, really mad at him. In the room with Africa was a 100 level philosophy student, Baba Tunde Oke. Tunde became collateral damage instantly. He took one to the stomach and would pass on later at the hospital. Knowing that legacy had escaped made them really angry. They screamed for him to come out repeatedly and as they couldn't find him, they then headed for Fajui Hall where a 400 level medical student, Eviano Ekelemo, was collateral damage as well. He got hit at point blank range in the thigh and groin area. He had come out from his room not knowing they were there. Meanwhile, when they left for Fajui Hall, legacy had come out of hiding and went straight to check on Africa. He saw what had been done to his friend and he had also seen that Baba Tunde was still alive. Baba Tunde, unable to speak, stretched forth his hands asking for help, which Legacy tried to get, but there was absolutely no one in sight and student was still very scared to come out of hiding. When he eventually did get him help, it was too late. So from Fajiri Hall, the attackers left on foot through the bush path they had come through behind the falls and made their wheels back to their parked vehicles, they drove straight to the student union building, the one housing the SUG offices. They turned it inside out looking for officials who had fled already. They also assumed that maybe Legacy, whom one of the informants had seen there at about 8 p.m., was still there and that was why they hadn't found him in his room. Then from there they drove out of the campus through the main gate where they had come through unchallenged. It was like they were working with time. Every single thing was planned out meticulously. It was like get in, do what we came to do, then get out like a well-coordinated SWAT team. So at the end of it all, these ones lost their lives. George Yemi Iwilade, known as Africa, Eviano Ekelemo, Yemi Ajetero, Babatunde Oke, and Ekpede Godfrey. Fast forward to the day after the attack, Legacy, the SCG president, presided over an emergency assembly at the amphitheater of Odudua Hall. He demanded that the then vice chancellor, Wale Omole, whom the students strongly believe had sponsored the attack, resign with immediate effect. Upon his pronunciation, hundreds of students occupied the school administrative building, refusing to leave until vice chancellor Wale Omole was fired. The sum of 100 US dollars was also offered for the capture of Omole because he was nowhere to be found. OAU was in total chaos. Students were fuming with anger over the incident, especially over Africa, who was known and loved for fighting for the rights of students. Legacy tried to bring calm. He spoke to his students at the Congress and they listened to him. He mobilized and some students went on a search and rescue mission to get students who were injured and still hiding out in the bushes to hospitals for proper treatment. Others went into the town in search for people whom they thought they recognized their voices or stature during the attack. And that was how they got hold of three guys whom they strongly believed were part of the operation. They dragged these guys back to campus to their World War Hall. These guys were Esekaye Akile, a 100 level student of agricultural economics, Emeka Ojuago and Frank Idahosa, also known as Efosa. Efosa and Ojuago were actually apprehended while in public vehicle as they were trying to flee Ileife. They still had with them their regalia that still had blood stains on them. Efosa was a well-known member of the particularly dreaded court group who had been expelled from the University of Benin due to issues related to his affiliation. He had then gained admission as a diploma student in the Department of Local Government Studies at Ileife. These guys were dragged back to the OAU campus and when they were taken to the coffee room at their volleyball hall, the student descended on them with anger of their falling comrades. They gave the trio the beating of their lives. Efosa and Ojoago in the process confessed to their involvement in the attack. If this was because they were given a beating of their lives or if it was real, it's not clear, but Efosa did admit that 
The attack was organized because they wanted to avenge the humiliation of their guys. Africa and his crew arrested on the 7th of March. Asekai Akile did not make it out alive from that coffee room. He was tortured to the very end. But at the end of the interrogation, it was brought to light that not less than 22 members of the said court group were involved in the July 10th attack. Six from the University of Ife, four from the University of Lagos, four from the University of Ibadan, eight from the University of Calabar, and an undisclosed number from the University of Benin. Conveniently, the Vice Chancellor at the time, Professor Wale Omole, was out of the country during all of this, and as soon as he returned, the government announced his suspension, and the new Vice Chancellor, Professor Roger Makonjola, took over. He spearheaded the investigations into the incident, and eventually, 12 individuals were arrested and charged to court, amongst whom were Frank Idahosa Efosa, Didi Yellow Tide, Kazem Katobello, and others simply known as Innocent, Athanasius, Ochuku and Chong, who was then the current head of the said court group at the time. As regards the guys arrested in the March 7th incident, two of them were already flown to France by their parents to further their studies. One was arrested and the rest just disappeared into thin air. A panel was set up in the nation's capital, Abuja, to make an inquiry into the case. In the course of the inquiry, the judicial panel of inquiry got to know that the guys who were supposedly charged to court had actually not even been given any trial at all because the school authority had helped to secure the freedom under the guidance of Wale Omole at the time. Not just this, it was also brought to light that one of the guys, Kazim Bello, also known as Kato, had allegedly confessed that Wale Omole, the then vice chancellor, was the sponsor of the July 10th incident. He had allegedly given them money from the university bursary, a sum of 350000 on the 8th of July, just two days before the attack. Allegedly, the university bursar also agreed that money was truly given out for some unknown security operation to one man who was also alleged to have passed this money on to the perpetrators. A trial would commence sometime in April of 2001. There were lots of ups and downs. Judges were getting transferred left, right, and center, thereby stalling the case. In a typical Nigerian fashion, eventually nothing came of this case, even though there was hard and glaring evidences. The last sitting judge upheld a no-case submission by the defense on 5th November 2002, and the accused individuals were released from custody, and they subsequently vanished, and that was it. I don't think anyone has been convicted or held accountable for the sad events that took place that fateful morning on the Obafemi Awolowo University campus. If you know more or have any information regarding this incident, do let us know in the comment section. It will be well appreciated. But for now, that's all I have for you concerning this attack on students of the Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife. Before you leave, consider hitting the subscribe button if you enjoyed this video and give this video a thumbs up. Until next time, stay safe.